Today is the launch of the 6500 XT, a valiant effort by AMD or a complete dumpster fire? Let's do this. Huh, what's this? The Symphony 240mm ARGB all-in-one liquid cooler from Antec. Let's check it out. What the? The Antec Symphony, with a premium looking mirrored ARGB pump head, high density tubing and ARGB PWM fans, the styling and performance will be music to your ears. Find out more by clicking the link in the description below. I don't know what it is, but when a GPU launches, I always get excited, probably more so than when any other type of product comes out. It's new, it's exciting, the manufacturer gives us some kind of promise of doing this and doing that. Whether it be giving us amazing performance in the latest titles or even as simple as sticking it to the miners and kind of giving us hope of actually being able to buy one. I want to break this video down into kind of a few sections and essentially try to play devil's advocate because I get where this card thinks it's sitting, but also why it's a complete mess. And you'll see this in the benchmarks a little later on. So bear with me, stick with me, it's worth kind of sticking around for. So let's talk about where it's kind of positioned. AMD found that 47% of gamers still use an RX 570 or GTX 1650 or slower graphics cards. Now, this number could be so high because consumers are happy with what they already have and found that it plays the games that they want to play perfectly fine. And they have no kind of want or need to upgrade or to play any of the newer, more demanding titles. Or kind of on the flip side, they may actually be in a situation where getting hold of a new GPU for the last 18 months has frankly been so difficult that, you know, they just, they're not really bothered. Now we all know why kind of getting hold of a GPU has been so difficult. Miners, scalpers, shipping costs. And at first glance, the new 6500 XT seemed to stick it to at least one of these factors, miners. Having a card with only four gig of VRAM basically means that Ethereum miners, which is still classed as the most profitable coin to mine right now, is basically nigh on impossible and has been for quite some time. Sure, there's other coins out there that are available, but I'm not talking about small scale operations. We're talking about those who are buying cards in droves and trying to get the very best return on their investment. The only problem with this is that AMD themselves gave us information back when the 5500 XT launched that four gig of VRAM simply wasn't enough. Hence why we saw two variants of that card, one with four gig of VRAM and one with eight gig. And this made a huge difference back in 2019 when it launched. And if anything, it's become an even stronger argument now in 2022. So as I mentioned, kind of devil's advocate over here, I see why they've done this to combat one thing, but have also contradicted themselves at the same time. I mean, to me, Frankly, it just doesn't make sense. Another area where things don't make sense is the specs, especially when comparing it to the likes of the RX 480 from June of 2016. The max performance is lower and it's missing vital components like encoding options. AMD have just kind of got rid of everything that matters to streamers and editors. And there are some theories as to why that's actually happened. The first being that they needed to make the 6500 XT a more power efficient GPU compared to previous cards. And this was the easiest way to do so. And the second but more likely option is that this should have never been classed as a desktop GPU. And instead, look at it as more of a entry level laptop GPU instead. The fact that the cards only have two connectors, one being DisplayPort and one being HDMI, the fact that it uses PCI Express 4.0 X4 bandwidth instead of something higher, and the fact that every current APU, to my knowledge, has the hardware encoding features that these cards are actually missing. When you start thinking about these things, it all starts to make a little bit more sense. So yes, while compared to older generation cards, which some will argue this is a refresh of a refresh of a refresh of a refresh, in the grand scheme of things, it is nowhere near as refreshing as drinking out of an eTechnics thermos that's available on store.etechnics.com. It still makes it the world's first six nanometer discrete GPU and one that's aimed at the entry level market with a price point of 199 US dollars. The problem there is that most will likely never see it at that price point and instead will be forced to part with more money and then be faced with the idea that potentially an older, 
yet more powerful GPU may actually be a better option. Sure, this is branded as the card that has the fastest clocks on a gaming card, but if it falls short in other areas, does that really even mean anything? I mean, having a Bugatti that can do 240 miles per hour and then put in biscuit wheels and part-worn tires on it, is, it's gonna bring that glorious number kind of back into reality. It's a weird analogy, I know, but frankly, it's all I've got right now. So spec-wise, I mean, it looks okay on paper, but the memory from what I first saw was always gonna be a big sticking point. Four gig on a 64-bit bus. I mean, is it really enough in 2022? Frankly, no. And AMD will argue that to kind of get around that, they have Fidelity FX Super Resolution, or FSR, which for those who don't know is AMD's equivalent of DLSS, which I've kind of been critical of both technologies when I tried it out on Cyberpunk 2077 and found it to add quite significant grain. Putting this feature on a card aimed at 1080p while giving you the frame rates that you crave may find you finding the quality suffering overall. Also factor in that every current GPU from both camps has this feature. Kind of makes this a point not really worth talking about. So the card launches today from a variety of brands. We've got two here with an SEP of $199, which probably translates to £199 in the UK due to taxes. And before we look at the benchmarks, I'll tell you now, if you're able to get this for that price, it's worth considering. But anything higher, I simply wouldn't bother. With that in mind, let's run them glorious benchmarks.
Now, before I dissect the results and kind of give my thoughts on it all, it's worth noting that I have two cards here, the Sapphire being the smaller of the two. Now, the Pulse Ranger has always been the kind of no frills option, offering a slightly smaller form factor without compromising on performance. And they tend to do it as close to MSRP pricing as possible. The card also comes with a pre-applied overclock straight out the factory for a small but modest performance boost over a reference spec model. In terms of pricing, We've heard, but haven't quite had confirmation at the time of filming, that this should be retailing for around £179 in the UK. So in theory, hitting that $199 MSRP in the States. And that, in my opinion, based on kind of the performance that we've seen, actually makes this a card I could possibly recommend. When it comes to the Gigabyte, it's a gaming OC. So of course it's going to be a tad more expensive than MSRP. Kind of for good reason. You end up with a cooling solution that's tried and tested, and that showed in the temperature levels where this came in six degrees lower than Sapphire at load. As always with kind of any current generation graphics cards, better temps means that it can keep a sustained level of boost clock for a longer period of time. And this showed again in the performance results when directly comparing against the Sapphire card in the likes of Horizon Zero Dawn and Borderlands 3, by albeit a small margin. When it comes to the gaming OC cards, I've kind of always been quite a big fan of them for offering up cool and quiet operation with a nice bump in performance. Whether you think the extra is worth it, well, that really comes down to personal preference based on the performance figures. Every consumer is different. Everyone has different budgets. So I guess I'll let you decide that for yourself. If you do see it and find that potentially it's over what you want to pay, then they do have lower tier cards like the Eagle, which should actually be launching very similar to the Sapphire for around MSRP. Again, at least at launch. We all know generally how this kind of goes. Is the 6500 XT worth it as a whole? Well, when it comes to the benchmarks, one thing was clear, four gig of RAM just doesn't cut it in 2022, at least with the latest titles. Sure, we could have dropped the settings down to medium or disabled some of those lovely textures, but you as a consumer want to have a card that kind of straight out the box works as intended. And for me, medium isn't it. I mean, for the price, and I'm talking about the magical and mysterious MSRP pricing, it's the best value you can get right now. Don't get me wrong. And in comparison to the next cards up in the stack, there's quite a big jump. But with Nvidia's RTX 3050 coming very soon, packing eight gig of VRAM, I honestly can only see one thing happening, and that is Nvidia handing a pretty firm bitch slap to AMD. The other area that is cause for concern for me is the interface, PCI Express X4, even if it is PCI Express 4.0. Really, it will see the general throughput the card suffer. Coupled with a small amount of VRAM, and quite frankly, some people are gonna see this as a bit of a recipe for disaster. So what's the general takeaway on these? I honestly believe that this card was kind of never meant to be. I even told AMD that, that it kind of seems it was maybe made for laptops and with Nvidia announcing the RTX 3050, AMD had to scramble and come up with something. It's just a shame that it's not something more and instead kind of falls short where it needs to stand tall. Maybe I'm being too critical, but I just feel that it just doesn't do enough. And in my eyes, there's a simple fix. Do like they did on the 5500 XT and create an eight gig version. Heck, if, if allowed, the AIBs could do this all on their own without AMD. Even with this, it will still fall behind on the bus compared to the upcoming RTX 3050 with its 128 bit interface, but at least it won't be dipping into your system memory because the latest titles need that extra memory. I mean, games are only gonna get more intensive as time moves on, and I can't see this maturing very well in the next six months to a year, can you? Ray tracing is the other thing. What's the point? It has it, but eh. Let me know what you guys think in the comments section below. Does the 6500 XT fall short? If so, what could AMD have done to make it better? More VRAM, a larger bus, or even with those two things, is it still just a bit lackluster? Again, at this price point, what other option do you have? Buy a used older card from eBay and hope that you don't get scalped, scammed, or ripped off? I mean, I can't help you there, but what I can help you with is the eTechnics PC Maintenance Toolkit, with everything you need to build, maintain, and repair your PC. Available over on store.etechnics.com. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, you know exactly what to do, and I'll see you in the next one.
Stay like, guys. Bye-bye.